Welcome to this episode of Wealth Uncensored. Uh, today, we're doing a different format. We have a guest, uh, attorney David Lesperance, who's one of the world's leading international tax and immigration lawyers. David has been advising high net worth families for over three decades on integrated tax and residence, citizenship, and domicile strategies that mitigate tax and family law threats while maximizing mobility and lifestyle needs. Welcome. Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast, straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton, Let's dive into today's show. David. Pleasure to be here, Jimmy. Is there anything else that you'd like to add about your background? I know that you have quite a bit of experience over the last three decades doing this, and, and you are one of the world's experts on it. Why don't you give us a little more detail about your, your background? Sure. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario, across from Detroit, so I'm a child of the auto industry. And what was quite common back in the day was when mothers would feel contractions, they'd cross the you know kilometer or if you've got an American audience mile across the river and uh, go to Henry Ford Hospital and they'd feel the contractions and have what they now call anchor babies. I was the third child. My parents were RH blood incompatible. So when my mother got pregnant with me, the doctor said, don't be screwing around driving across the bridge. You have that kid in Canada. He's going to need blood transfusions. So literally the only... The only reason I did not get a U.S. citizenship is because my parents had incompatible blood. That's one part of my background. The other part is I swear my siblings and I didn't go out nightclubbing looking for Europeans to dance with, but my sister married a Latvian, then a German. My brother married an Italian. I married a Scotswoman, then a Pole, and my younger sister married an Irishman. So I've been doing lineage citizenships since before I got called to the bar in 1990. And and the last element, again, if you look at my resume, it looks quite Machiavellian, but I can tell you I didn't plan out playing this out that carefully, but I needed a summer job. And my father was implementing the auto pack. So he got me a job working for customs at the Windsor Detroit tunnel, which is the busiest car entry. And a couple of days was sweltering in my little booth and seeing the immigration people with their feet up reading the newspaper. I thought that would be the job for me. So I worked as a port of entry officer. Then we moved to Toronto and I did it through going to law school. I did it at the busiest air entry points. So that kind of wielding the chop gives you a, a it came in really handy when I was later dealing with clients because I could understand what the audience, the immigration officials in various countries, what concerned them and kind of cater my submissions to them appropriately. Today, we're going to be talking about fire insurance policies for, for Americans, what to do in different search situations, where to go, and um, how to protect yourself means of your physical location. And that obviously takes the, you're going to move or you're going to go somewhere that requires the ability to do so, right? It'll be the ability to travel there, the ability to potentially become a resident there. If you wanted to move to Europe, for example, you know, you need a European passport. I mean, at least that would be the easiest way to do it. Why don't you elaborate a little bit on the way you categorize the different types of fire insurance that you think you can get? Because as I, as I know, you, you, there's sort of three pillars to this or, or three different scenarios where this could become relevant. Yeah. And, and apologies in advance to any Americans that a Canadian is talking about wildfires. And uh, the first thing is, what are those wildfire kind of concerns? Well, they could be a variety or a combination of things. It could be the rise in anti-Semitism. It could be, you know, uh, increase in mass shootings. I mean, I grew up across from Detroit when it was Murder City, but then it was, you know, two drug dealers shooting at each other with Saturday Night Specials. Today, it's, you know, random people walking in with AR-15s and shooting at bowling alleys and synagogues. And it taxed the rich proposals, uh, taxing unrealized capital gains, loss of step up, et cetera, et cetera. My clients tend to have a, a wide variety of wildfire concerns. So logically, what do you do if you're in a wildfire zone? And some say, well, I'm going to fight. I'm going to vote. I'm going to register. And that's great. But no crew chief drops a crew into a hot zone without an exit strategy. So we look at the fire insurance and alternative residences and citizenships, and then the fire escape plans, which tend to fall into three types. One is what we call the go bag option, which is, oh my God, there's been a hurricane or an earthquake. I need to bug out for some period of time, but I'm not going to be in Canada, Portugal, or wherever I'm bugging out to. 
long enough to become tax resident in that country. The second is, oh my God, insert name of political party you don't like. Uh, as God in, I'm going to leave for four years, or I want to give my children kind of an education abroad for their high school. And that'll be, I'm going to be an American citizen, U.S. taxpayer, but I'm going to be tax resident in another jurisdiction. And of course, there's a difference that a tax treaty jurisdiction and non-tax treaty is zero tax ju- jurisdiction. And the last is full-blown expatriation, where they're legally and permanently leaving the U.S. tax system. What What are some of the scenarios that your clients worry about where they think that the go-back option would be correct for them? Well, maybe natural disasters. It may be um, some local e- event, uh, you know, a, a, a dirty bomb going off or an earthquake or a, a hurricane are the most common kind of uh, uh, situations. It may be that they're kind of worried, you know, uh, particularly in election uh, year, that we may have an increase in, in political violence, and they just want to kind of leave until that event goes by. And they look at and where they go to depends on a lot of things. 30 to 35% of Americans may have claim to a lineage citizenship in some EU country. And they don't have to go back to the old country. In fact, having the citizenship of an EU country gives you 27 different options. And so we have a lot of people that are applying for that. I have a lot of Jewish American clients who are making Ali out to Israel. Interestingly, at the same time, I have a lot of Israelis who are looking to get alternative residences to Israel. And so that's really, they've got it in their back pocket just in case. It's like, you know, just because you buy fire insurance doesn't mean that you want to have a fire. It just means it comes in very handy should a fire occur. One of the questions that, that I have on the, on the fire insurance option, because is it, it sounds to me like this is more of a, of a short-term move, right? I mean, the, the American intends on returning back to, to the U.S. in a relatively short period of time. And Correct. in that case, how necessary is it really to have another citizenship or residency? Because if you're only going to be spending a few months somewhere, let's say, could you do that on a tourist visa, for example, on, on a, with, with a U.S. passport? Or do you really need another citizenship or residency in order to do that? Well, visitor status is going to be, give you a finite period of time. So, for example, an American going to what are called the Schengen states, think continental European Union, that's only 90 days. 90 days can go by, especially when you don't know if they're, when you're going to be able to return. Uh, other countries like Canada may give you six months. And so we f- have a lot of clients that say, well, I don't know. And I may very well turn into that American living abroad. I want the flexibility. And gee, if I happen to have an Irish grandmother or a claim to a lineage citizenship, why wouldn't I get it? Because I don't sure. have a limit on the amount of time that I, I can spend in any of those foreign jurisdictions. So are, are most of your clients that are exploring the go-back option, are they exploring more trying to get citizenship through through lineage, or are they looking at citizenship by investment, or are they simply looking at obtaining a residence somewhere, maybe not another citizenship? What's sort of most typical there? Well, if they're entitled to lineage citizenship, America allows you to have multiple citizenships. Most people have only two, hence the kind of common term dual citizenship. But you could have, it. I once had a client who had eight citizenships, would have had nine, but he gave up his U.S. citizenship for all the reasons that we know yeah. and uh, and things. So citizenship lineage, if, if you have the right family history, it's, it's cheap. It's not terribly fast. It'll take a year and a half or two years to process. We're getting clients that you don't necessarily need to have a residence permit. You may be able to have a pensioner or retiree residence permit. You may be able to have a work permit, especially when we're dealing with business people. It may be as simple as, for example, creating a Canadian subsidiary of your existing U.S. corporation and getting a work permit. So you've always got that insurance policy in your pocket. Certainly, I absolutely agree. If you're entitled to second citizenship by, by lineage, I mean, that's obviously not something where you're going to have to spend a, a lot of money to, to obtain it because you're not going to have to make an investment. And if you qualify for a second citizenship, why not get it, right? I mean, especially if you're going to be able to do it cost effectively. But it's interesting what you say about Canada. Is it that simple to get a, a Canadian work permit? It, it, it's just a matter of setting up a company and then employing yourself? Sure. It's not for the average person, for, for the business owner or the senior executive, it can be that easy. And with the what we used to call NAFTA, which 
in the U.S. is USMCA, but on the Canadian side has got the unfortunate acronym CUSMA, Canada-U.S.-Mexico Agreement. We'll still we'll just call it NAFTA for you can get that fairly quickly. I mean, we can organize that that kind of uh, intercompany uh, work permit under the agreement as quickly as we pull together the documentation and get the person to the border and they can walk away from the border with a work permit. I mean, well, I think Canada is a, a great option, right? It still is proximity wise, very close to the U.S. and somebody might want to get out to a, to another continent. What are some of the other popular places that your clients look at when it comes to the, the go back option. Mexico is another option that we see a lot of. Um, there's been a lot of interest uh, in European destinations like Portugal. There's been a lot of changes in the gold and visa option. For the person who's looking for the go bag option, they really need to look at the gold and visa option. For those who are going to pick up and move and spend the time six months plus in Portugal, then you know they can look at something called the D7. And one of the kind of important things for people to understand is when I'm giving my advice, I don't take commissions from anybody. So if we need to go for a residence or a citizenship by investment, I actually give back the client whatever commission is payable so that they know my advice is unconflicted and, and completely agnostic. I think one of the other places that I'm seeing a lot of people get second residencies is, is here in the UAE. They've made it very easy to get a golden visa here, which is 10-year visa. You can do it easily through investing in property or in a business. And obviously, you know, there's no income taxes here. There's also no tax treaty, but at least for an American, you'd only be paying taxes in, in the United States and not here, which is attractive to a lot of people. I first went to the to the UAE in 1990. My partner wow. lived there for 25 years. So the jurisdiction very familiar with, and you're quite right, it's, quite, it's very popular, especially for clients who they don't want to be on some you know remote island where there's no restaurants or For sure. or airports or offices or staff or any of those things. I I sometimes have clients say, look, I've been audited, I've been sued, I've gone through a divorce, move me somewhere with no lawyers and no taxes. And I say, well, we can move you to Pitt, Karen Island, but only 38 people on earth have decided that that's where they want to live. Oh no, no, I want this, I want this, I want yeah. this. And the UAE checks a lot of those boxes. It's very safe, I mean, which I really do quite a bit of business in, in Europe and spend some time there. And, um, you know, you always have to be concerned about your safety. You know, I've had a couple of friends be robbed for, for their watches, you know, in, in the UK and other places. And that's something that's just unheard of here in, in the UAE, which a lot of people value as well. And just quality of life. There isn't the, the, the crime issue. You can get everything from kind of, Lego land to, you know, high end advice. Let's talk a little bit about the second group of people, which would be the people that are considering or who may consider moving abroad for, for a longer period of time. I know that this, you know, we've had a couple of cases where we've talked about some clients that were just interested in potentially a second citizenship, but at, the, at a minimum, just having residency somewhere, just in case, like the example that, that you said, that you know, they're unhappy with the political situation in the U.S., that they're going to get out of Dodge for a few years, or that they're concerned about civil unrest or something like that, and they want an option to go somewhere else. And one of the keys that, that people forget whenever they're talking about this is whatever solution and destination you have, you got to be able to sell it at the breakfast table. If you're bringing family members along, if you've got a spouse or children who are unhappy and their needs aren't met, the plan is not sustainable. It tends to fall into kind of two broad categories, what I'll call tax treaty jurisdictions and non-tax treaty jurisdictions. And there are a number of treaty jurisdictions which have favorable tax outcomes in that you're not adding on the the tax of the burden of a of a local tax. Of course you're still in that second group, you're still an American, you're still a US person for tax purposes, you've got all your US obligations, but you're not kind of the tax lawyer's Hippocratic oath which is cause no further tax. You can set it up and you've got different structures from remittance basis to lump sums to the non-habitual residence regime or you can go to places which don't have local tax or not pick Karen Island but have actually types of things you have. I mean 
Whenever people talk about going to tax havens, they think of Cayman Islands. Well, Cayman's, Grand Cayman's a nice place, but it's a small island. And once sure. you've kind of played all three golf courses and been to Stingray City a couple of times and eaten in all four decent restaurants, it doesn't really meet life. Whereas if you can go to a jurisdiction which has a higher quality of life, a no additional tax burden basis, an optimal outcome. I think most of my clients have been looking at the European jurisdictions, right? I mean, looking at places like Switzerland, looking at Italy, Portugal, although maybe you could give us a little bit, your listeners, a little bit more information on what's going on in, in Portugal, because it seems like they keep wanting to get rid of the non-habitual resident regime, and then they bring it back and then it goes away again. So maybe you could give a little bit of an update on, on what's going on there, because it seems like Portugal might be becoming a little bit unreliable. I'm going to have to uh, defer a bit because on Thursday, I'm having a deep dive with a Portuguese lawyer um, to looking specifically at the new program. So the NHR is available basically, if we're talking about clients who haven't started yet, who are starting now, haven't got it, applied for it yet, they're going to be under the new program. And the new program has a lot of the good features of the NHR. It's different in certain key ways, but it is going to be attractive for Americans. It's also going to be attractive for people relocating from the UK. It is a system, unlike, say, a remittance or a lump sum, which requires proper planning, that you properly exclude from Portuguese tax what can be excluded under the regime. But in your opinion, it's still a viable option for, for folks. First thing is, in the second scenario, these are clients who are going to spend more than six months and become tax resident in another jurisdiction such as Portugal. Therefore, they're wrangling. Well, at the same time, they're also fulfilling the requirements of the D7. So they don't have to do a golden visa. So they've saved themselves by an investment of 500,000 euros, but they've got the complication of, of the dealing with another tax jurisdiction. Whereas okay. you don't have that problem in places like the UAE because you don't have to deal with the UAE tax system. One of the questions that I have, because you know we're still talking about this second group of Americans, well, these are the people that might be leaving for a more extended period of time. They may eventually decide to expatriate or something like that. But these are mm -hmm. people that are, are likely going to become resident or tax resident somewhere else. If I understand correctly, if you become a tax resident of a country and you're spending more than six months there, you know, you're know you in their tax system and all this stuff, that eventually that could potentially lead to citizenship in that jurisdiction. Correct. In, in, in some jurisdictions, yes. For example, in the UAE, getting citizenship through naturalization is not straightforward. That's, that's exclusively yeah. the... The purview of Sheikh Rashid. In other jurisdictions, such as Italy, it's a longer period of time. There are some language requirements, some physical presence requirements. So you have to look at each jurisdiction to see really what the requirements are. So I say you kind of plant the seed of residence, and then you have to look at what do I need to do in order to water this with physical presence, tax, language ability, in order for it to bear the fruit of naturalization after whatever the naturalization period is. You know, the go bag people. They're looking for some place to escape to for a short period of time. They might not actually be there for six months or more. They might not actually meet the requirements to be a tax resident. So most likely their residence wouldn't lead to a citizenship in a jurisdiction. But let's say, for example, somebody who doesn't qualify for citizenship by lineage anywhere. So that either leaves you with spending enough time in a jurisdiction in order to get the passport or it leaves you with citizenship by investment. And so if you were somebody that maybe didn't have the, the funds for citizenship by investment, or if they weren't happy with the citizenship by investment options, then one option would be to choose a jurisdiction which maybe had a passport that they were interested in and spending enough time in that country in order to be able to qualify for that citizenship. So like you said, it, it's a matter of finding the right jurisdiction for you so that you eventually could obtain that citizenship. Yeah. So it's understanding kind of what the breakfast table family needs are. What's your budget? What's your time, time frame? What is the wildfire concern? Could it turn into moving from go bag to American living abroad to expatriation, depending on what happens politically, legislatively? tax policy wise. And so we do see a lot of clients that start off with the kind of go bag option because that makes just as much sense as getting house insurance to protect themselves and their family well-being. 
And then they find, oh, okay, well, this event happened. I'm now spending more time than I thought abroad. And then I've had clients who were forced out of the island of Manhattan because of the pandemic, all of a sudden realized there's life outside of Manhattan. And as they're sitting in the Hamptons or wherever and listening to the New York mayoral race talk about increasing the taxation, they go, well, Palm Beach, Miami is looking pretty good. And they got over that life inertia. They couldn't imagine going over the bridge and tunnel into New Jersey even before, but now all of a sudden they've discovered, honey, did you know that there's this thing called DoorDash? Oh, now yeah. I know you're talking about this Amazon Prime. Oh, you know, I got a Zoom or a Teams account. And they discover that they can actually live. And and so they've overcome that life inertia. I, I've had a lot of clients since it first became popular after the 2008 crash look at Puerto Rico. And then I had a group of crypto clients more recently kind of look at it. And Puerto Rico is a great solution. I have native Puerto Rican clients who, you know, that's home to them. But it's a big move from the island of Manhattan to the island of Puerto Rico. And oftentimes that strategy falters at the breakfast table because the spouse doesn't like it or the kids don't like it. We're getting those clients who thought they would be kind of Americans living abroad, i.e. Puerto Rico versus Portugal, but and getting some tax advantages in doing that, but they just found it wasn't sustainable. And so we have those clients either moving back, they don't go back to New York City, they go to Florida or Texas, or they decide, okay, I'm going to pull the trigger here and do a, a proper permanent and legal separation away from Puerto Rico. I'm not an expert of Puerto Rico, but you know, I have had several clients interested in that option because I mean it's from a tax perspective, it's very advantageous for America. I mean it's probably the best tax option out there. But it does require you to spend more than six months in Puerto Rico. I think that that's a very tough thing for both people to achieve. The kind of old days when you could effectively engage in tax evasion because they weren't watching so closely, those are gone. And so yeah. I've had clients, I mean, and the IRS are, are fishing where the fish are, right? So the IRS descended with all these agents looking at all these people there on, on Act 20 or, or Act 60 and challenging them. And I've had people say, well, I'm not really here, but I gave my gardener a credit card to buy groceries and gas. It's like, okay, well, now you're willful. I've had clients who said, well, I fly privately into Teterboro. And he said, well, you don't think they mark people? Like everybody on the Lolita Express discovered that they actually keep logs of this. This is something I tell my clients all the time. The days of living in one place and hoping to be taxed in another place does not work. And with all the technology, yeah. like you said, cell phones and all this stuff. Beyond that, it's just not worth the risk. You get caught trying to take affirmative steps to defraud the government, giving your gardener a credit card. You could wind up a convict or something like that. And that's not going to be good for your family, for your business, for banking, for anything. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.